Look around you. So much of our modern world is new. New ideas, new buildings, new narratives. And that's great. Change is necessary for progress. The whole world gets it. So how is it possible that despite all this progress, we still learn in the exact same way our grandparents did? Our education is evolving so slowly. But why? What if your education could evolve and improve as quickly as the world around us does? What if your education was designed to help you discover who you really are? If students were created like co-creators instead of just products? If there was a space meant to build connections between teachers and students? A place where safe space doesn't mean you'll be shielded by censorship. Where liberty isn't just what you learn, but how. Your education should keep up with the rest of the world. And now, it can. So the format of the co-creation forum is all about engagement, creation, collaboration. It's about transforming our meetings, our classrooms or our events in dynamic places where people get together, where they form new relationships, where they have meaningful interactions and they create uh, value for things they think are really important. Cada persona tiene algo valioso que aportar. Todo, eso, todo ese conocimiento que está disperso se puede unir y uno puede ir trabajando sobre las ideas de los demás. ¿Qué es el entorno ideal para aprender nuevas herramientas? Para facilitar el poder trabajar proyectos, resolver problemas en conjunto con, uh, con personas que vienen de diferentes entornos, con diferentes tipos de ideas y de alguna manera a través de este sistema de co-creación se pueden llegar a respuestas que uno jamás se hubiera imaginado. The training is experiential and practical. Uh, the participants learn by observing, by practicing, by receiving and giving feedback. And by the end of the training, it's them who run the show. You can use this process to help almost anyone. It's customizable, you can incorporate it with different backgrounds, uh, people of different organizations, and in my case, uh, organizations that work in so many different states uh, across the United States. Um, I'm re really looking forward to using this process to challenge our current assumptions and solicit feedback from others. El proceso es venir con la mente abierta, que el proceso funciona, y el proceso genera respuestas. Y tal vez más importante, el proceso genera más preguntas. The co-creation forum was exhilarating for me. It is a unique collaborative experience and it's in a very safe, welcoming space. Your uh, unique perspective feel valued uh, despite your age or background and uh, an opportunity to learn new ways to question how we do things and how to make them better and have more fun while doing it. Hola a todos, bienvenidos a la primera UFM Talk, compartida por formación continua. Yo soy Carmen Rodríguez y quiero recordarles que esta es una serie de 20 conversaciones acerca de distintos temas y alrededor de, de distintas ideas que va a ser, van a ser confiadas por diferentes facultades y departamentos de la UFM. Así que no se las pierdan. 
la primera conversación es esta que se llama The Fundamentals of Learning y para eso invitamos a Rachel Davis and Humphrey. Hello! Welcome, Rachel. So we're super excited and honored to have you here. Rachel is the director of outreach of the Bill of Rights Institute, and she is going to be our partner in crime for this one-hour conversation. And Rachel is great. You'll see she's energetic. She's a passionate educator. She's a great learner, a great reader, as you can see. <laughs> curious, loving, and she has more than 10 years of experience in the non-traditional educational environment, like uh, Montessori classrooms, blended uh, learning programs, great book programs, Socratic programs. And she just finished her master's on learning design and technology at Georgetown University. So congrats. And thank you so much for taking the time for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Carmen. And please, to everyone who's watching, thank you so much for joining. And don't forget to send your questions on Facebook chat and we'll be reading them. You can send them on Spanish and we'll translate them. So Rachel, again, thank you for being here. And really this whole conversation started because we get so many faculty and uh, so many teachers asking us questions about technological tools and gadgets they can use in the, in the classroom. And we often forget about the fundamentals of learning that don't really change. How we learn, how we think, how we read, how we make meaning, how we struggle for learning something hard, and the importance of choice and relevance in the classroom, those things don't really change as much as the technology does. So it's not necessarily about the means, which would be the tools that we use for learning, but about the ends or what our objectives are. So my first question is, what should we as teachers keep in mind as we design courses for the upcoming year and semester, which We'll start online. People, right? So, you know, you have all of these ways that you were trained to, to help your students or that you've had experience with your students over the years of your teaching career. And then all of a sudden, it's a different world. And that can be really overwhelming, not only for you, but for your students. Um, it can be over, it's, it's, I mean, it's overwhelming kind of globally right now. Um, but there was a, you know, there's this energy and this passion towards supporting your students that, that every teacher has. And so the question is, how do you do that best? And the answer is that that's different for every educator because we all have different strengths in the same way that each one of our students has unique strengths and abilities. Each one of us as educators has unique abilities. Um, but there are some things to keep in mind, right? So I think in my teaching career and in my experience within education and in, in the program that I just finished, which again is a learning design and technology program, which I happened to finish in May in the middle of a global pandemic where people were more interested in technology and education integration than they have been recently. So that was well-timed. I didn't plan it that way, <laughs> but it definitely worked out that way. Um, and one of the things we talked a lot about in that course is the history of education technology that, you know, we're always looking for efficiencies. That's, that's what education technology offers. So it's what is it that the technology can do that I can't do or that it can do better than I can do so it'll free up the things that I do best, right? So that's always kind of the mindset when we go into adding some sort of technology adaptation to our classroom that we should have is, there's this great book called Should Robots Replace Teachers by Neil Selwyn. Uh, Neil Selwyn is a technologist, an educational technologist. I think he's in Australia, um, maybe he's in the UK, but he wrote this, it's a very short book. It's only, it was a, it was a Kindle book, um, highly recommended because what he talks about in that book is that, that there are, there are efficiencies like grading and attendance and those sorts of things, which makes sense to have technology do. But then there are a lot of things which don't make sense. So how do we take what technology can do, augment it, systematize it, add it to our suite of resources, and then leave the things that are essentially human learning experiences to the experiences that we have? Um, so one simple way to think about this is, you know, I don't know what platform does UFM use for its online learning. Which are you? Uh, are you? Um, uh, uh, which platform do you guys use? 
we're using Miu, which is our own learning management system, and uh, Zoom for all the and Zoom for the for the media. So there there are all these platforms, right? You have Moodle, you have um, Canvas, you have Blackboard, you have Adobe Connect, you have you have all these different platforms, right? And they all have their own functions. Um, and Zoom is a great great addition in the video platform in the video platform. But so there are things on Mew and on on Canva that do do kind of easy check ins with your students, right? Prompting them to fill out their um, assignments so you don't have to send an email or you don't have to verbalize it in class. There are things that those th that those platforms don't do well, like, you know, answering deep philosophical questions about your field. The way that you can organize um, a, uh, uh, um, a conversation is very stilted and it has use. One of the things that it can do that an in-classroom experience can't do is it can surface student questions before the classroom conversation starts. So every student comes into the class with all these questions in their mind and you as the facilitator or educator don't know what those questions are because you've had no way to access them. But with this technology, we now can access all those amazing questions before they get into the class. And now we have this more robust conversation that can take place because we were able to facilitate the question asking before we got there. And even some of the some of the question answering, like start those conversations in the message boards. And then when you get into class, you can have that much more robust a conversation. So those are some things to think about um, as you as you think about, you know, how do I adapt? What technologies do I use? What technologies don't I use? There are a million and they were all free for a little while so we could play with them all. <laughs> um, and now that they're not gonna be free again, we're gonna have to make choices with our scarce resources about how to use them. Um, but, but really it's about getting to that part, that core relational part of our of our time together as learners, and then what can supplement and really support it rather than what can replace it. Awesome. And how do you suggest teachers think about their course objectives? And by the way, I was just reading this book, Robot Proof. Yeah. So that is a phenomenal book by by Aoun. He's the he's the president of Northwestern University. Um, and he talks about this quite a bit. Yes. Well, absolutely. I, and education teachers, we should focus on what's human about learning, not necessarily, and use the tools, as you were saying, to uh, support what we do best, which is helping students with their meaning making and uh, helping them ask and answer their own questions. Right. So as we're thinking about designing our courses, what are some important pedagogical concepts that we should keep in mind and where should we start? Yeah, I think that, that that's a really hard question for any anyone who's passionate about their field, right? Like you are this, you, the reason you entered the field that you're in is because you love whatever the subject, it's something captured your imagination about it, something captured your your life's energy and you have devoted yourself to this work. And so there's this instinct to share and you wanna make sure that they really understand these like really fundamental concepts, right? There are concepts that they should know. The question to ask yourself is why? <laughs> So there are a couple of ways that people design courses. Um, some people have um, a chronological mindset. So you start at the beginning of the understanding of the field and you move your way kind of through understandings. Um, some people have project-based mindsets where like there's a task that they're going to experience at the end of this or um, or there is a particular skill set for a particular industry. So they have a very, um, a very industry specific conception of what is necessary for the for the for the concepts to be covered in a course the one that i have had the most um experience with and was most transformative for me was this idea called threshold concepts um that that we could organize and design our courses around particular concepts that transform the thinking of the student so for instance, in economics, um, uh, the idea of, of, of um, 
oh, what's the cost? When the opportunity cost, opportunity cost is a threshold concept, right? Once you, so threshold concepts have four, four qualities. They're transformative. Once you see it, you're like, oh my goodness, the world is different than it was before I understood this thing. They're irreversible. You can't unsee it after you've understood it, right? So entropy, you can't un-understand the world by entropy once you've understood the world, uh, the, the physics of entropy. They're integrative, which means that they, they take background knowledge and synthesize it and integrate it together. And the last aspect of a threshold concept is that they're troublesome. They're, they're hard to understand. It's not, it's not something that you intuit. Um, it, it takes work and energy to understand the concept. But once you do that, it's this transformative concept that you can't unsee. Uh, and so there are ways to design around these threshold concepts within your field. And when you do that, say you spend you know, a week or two weeks on each concept building up the, the understanding to that concept. When you do that, there are all these secondary effects. Because it's troublesome, it naturally requires the work. The work then is meaningful because it has an end in mind. It's contained so it doesn't run on a long time. Um, and it's the most important things for them to understand in your field. And they have this personal transformation at the end of it, which is a, this added bonus. All of us love when we're in the classroom when the students go, oh, right? That aha moment is what we live for as educators when they when they come to that understanding. Um, so those are those are that's a way that I found to organize your resources. And then the other thing to think about is especially when you're in a time where you have these really clear constraints on the time that the students have, there's the need to haves and the nice to haves, right? And when we have time in classroom, we can have a lot of nice to haves. Um, and the question becomes, what are the need to haves? And I think that when we think, um, when we think about readings, especially when we think about assignments or essays or, or journal articles that we're giving our students, making sure that those articles are essentially interesting to them, that there are questions within, that they're not just content transfer, because content transfer can be done in a lecture and often is better done in a lecture than by having them read primary sources, right? A primary source, a, a, a journal article or, a, or, a, um, or an essay should really have some philosophical, something that they're wrestling with because what that then does is that gives them questions that they can come back to. And because you don't have any of the secondary social environments, having the readings themselves provide questions can be really, really beneficial. Wow, that's amazing. So what are some, or what would you say are some of the most important concepts or elements of online learning? Given that, okay, we have the content, we've defined our threshold concepts, I'm ready with my must-haves versus my would be nice to have. And now that I know what I want my students to be able to do and to be able to know by the end of a course, what should I take into account as I design an online course? Yeah. And I think that scaffolding that like, so we're in a weird moment, right? It's not, students are not choosing online courses. They're, they're being required to take online courses. There are certain students who online courses work better for them, right? Like they, they would prefer that and you have them take, there are lots of people around the world who, who do MOOCs and take online degrees. And that is a personal choice because they understood that that was the best learning environment for them. What we have now is millions of people who didn't have that choice, who much would prefer the modality of in-person programming. And so that is, that's the first hurdle to overcome, right? That we have, you know, this isn't our choice and this is no one's choice, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be an amazing substitute. And here's how we're gonna make it a substitute. It's never gonna replace the experience of in-person programming. It's never gonna replace the experience of living on campus and seeing your friends and going to the cafeteria. What it will do is we can do specific things to help create community. So 
as you're designing your online course, because you don't have any of the secondary language, you don't have any of the secondary social opportunities, like people gathering in the beginning of class, um, people chatting in small groups, people getting together for study groups, you kind of have to build that in, in order to create the same energy around your course. So for instance, um, when, if you have a, uh, a lecture course, breaking up your lecture into 15 minute breaks and then breaking the students into small groups in Zoom to talk about what you're doing for five minutes, come back with questions and then you continue with your lecture is a great modality to help support that culture building that happens naturally in, a, in an environment where you just have young people together because they're very social, uh, <laughs> but doesn't, which won't happen naturally in an online environment. So things like that. Um, additionally, uh, one of the, there's this idea of Zoom fatigue that humans are not built to, to focus on screens for eight hours a day or six hours a day or four hours a day. If I have a meeting where I, if I have a day where I'm in meetings for four or five hours on Zoom, I am, ex and I'm an, I am a deep extrovert. I don't know if that comes through on my screen, but <laughs> I, I love people. I love talking to people, but there, I have a threshold when it comes to Zoom meetings. And there's a great article on, um, on, uh, from BBC that talks about why this is the case. And they go through a bunch of the reasons, which, which include that it's harder to process nonverbal cues and delays stress us out. Like anytime something freezes or there's a pause, you're not sure if it's your technology that stopped or like you, that your silence is making you ang um, anxious. You're never not the focus of attention on a Zoom on a Zoom call, which is extraordinarily stressful for especially late adolescents. Um, you know, when you're in a classroom, you can kind of, and even in a small seminar, everybody's attention is diverted to the speaker, right? Now everyone is the speaker all the time because our faces are in front of everyone all the time and that can add stresses. And so, you know, there are all these stressors that are, are different in the online environment. And so how do we mitigate that? One of the best ways to do that is to limit the synchronous time. So when you have the opportunity to have meaningful, synchronous, purposeful engagements, make those purposeful and then do as much as you can um, asynchronously with recorded lectures or message boards coming together for purposeful activity letting the things that can be done on people's own time on their own time. So how I love the idea of asynchronous learning, which is uh, people don't have to meet at the same time for say two hours in a row to have a class, but people can do assignments before beforehand. And then when right. they do meet and they, when they do see other learners, it's to make meeting out of the readings or the assignments that they had ahead of time. Ask so questions you, that they couldn't ask. Yeah. How would you recommend that we start designing asynchronously if we've never done that before? Yeah. Well, and I think it's what, I mean, well, firstly, um, mo many, if, if your course is mostly lecture based, many of those lectures, and I, I would think about which of your lectures you know the best and which of the, your lectures you're most comfortable with and which of your lectures require your students to ask questions, right? So, so there, in, in anyone's lecture cycle, there are gonna be lectures where you're just like, I just have to get through this content. <laughs> and then there are other lectures where like, this is really kind of like complex stuff and I need to be checking on their understanding more often. Yeah. So for the lectures where it's really just like, I need to present this content, pre-record that. What that does for the student is not only it gives them the time to do it on their own, but it lets them back up. And because you're used to giving the lecture, you're probably speaking kind of quickly, you're getting through content, and that gives them a record of that. One of the cool things about a lot of platforms is you can embed quizzes in those, right? Or you can give them a reading guide that quizzes them as they do it. So one of the things you can do with your lecture is you can have your lecture and then have an assignment right after the lecture that tests their knowledge of that lecture. That's hard to do in person. That's very easy to do online. 
Um, so choose those lectures, which are the ones that are that are more direct transfer and pre-record them or type them out. If you have lecture notes and you have them already typed out, just use those and give them to them and have them quiz themselves or give a free response or a small writing response to that. It, it, it serves the same function as checking their understanding. It serves a better function sometimes because you don't always get those feedback in those conversations. Um, and I think that, that that's one way to think about it. The other thing to think about is um, seeding question boards. If, you're, if, you're, if your assignments are more reading based, using the using the discussion boards in a really precise way you can ask different kinds of questions you can ask textual questions you can ask synthesis questions and you can ask exploratory questions and making sure that you're you know what it is you want like te technical questions textual questions those are things students should be doing themselves they're not part of conversation right if someone doesn't understand a word or a term or a concept that's something that they should do asynchronously. You don't need to spend the whole group time to get to those questions. Um, the, the kind of exploratory questions are those questions that you want to know what they're thinking. And then when they come into class, you can explore them with them. And that's so much more exciting. Yeah. And I have a little announcement. If anyone watching wants to redesign their course and wants to record videos and design asynchronous, oh, so write us an email or uh, go to our website. We have a ton of resources there, but Formacion Continua at ufm.edu will be happy to help. And what, as I was listening to you, Rachel, that reminded me of so many. We sent out a survey to all of our faculty and to all of our students. And the one thing that concerned students the most was how they felt depleted and fatigued and tired and they couldn't concentrate. And then teachers, their biggest concern was that they couldn't keep uh, their students' attention and they couldn't see if they were engaged or not. So yeah, stress and dealing with all of this social, emotional, political, like being in lockdown, it's not nice what we're going no. through. We're going through a pandemic. No. What are exactly. some like psychological and yeah, what, what are some of the things that we should also keep in mind? Absolutely. So I think one of my professors at um, at Georgetown did did this amazing thing, and it was so powerful. And it, it, I granted it can only be done in smaller seminar courses. Is what he did is he took the um, took our comments. So we had to write a response to the readings and submit the response. But he would take our comments and over the course of the conversation, he would say each one of our names at least once, and he had a little checklist. He made sure that every single person heard their name come out of the professor's mouth <laughs> every single class. Um, and that was really powerful because that, that had you feel heard, that let you know he actually read your responses, which isn't always the case. Um, uh, but little things like that, like check-ins at the beginning, you have a two hour class. In normal time, there would be people coming in and leaving and you having to take a break and all those sorts of things. You don't have that right now. So maybe that time could be used to check in with the class. How's everybody doing? Right? Like that kind of just is, you know, what have you guys, what has brought you joy this week? What's a good thing that happened this week? Right? And doing those kinds of culture building activities, um, will go a long way to having students feel engaged with your course material. Um, if you're familiar, there's a there's a com comedic troupe called Penn and Teller, um, who are uh, who are magicians and comedians, and uh, Penn is a very tall, strapping, loud man, and Teller is this very short man, also a magician, um, who never speaks in any of their kind of uh, in any of their shows. But Teller was a, he was a Latin teacher. He was a high school Latin teacher before he became a comedian and, <laughs> and magician. And he wrote a beautiful essay. And in that essay, he said that as a teacher, you are the, you are the, the vision of the subject in the mind of the student. Or you are, you are the example of the subject in the mind of the student. And so that doesn't mean you have to be like the most entertaining or energetic. We're all different. Um, we all have the ways that we express our passions, but 
that if, if the student cares about you and you care about the student, that relationship bleeds over into the content discussions. Um, and that, that we can't help it because learning is a social activity. We don't, we don't ever learn unless we want to, right? Like there's a, there are old proverbs about that, that we, we only ever learn when we want to learn. No one can force you to learn anything. It has to be an internally motivated activity. So how do you grease the wheels of that internal motivation? Well, you create relationships that are authentic. Um, young people will know when you're not being authentic, but <laughs> um, I think that taking that dedicated time to check in with students, making, making more space for conversation um, and making their voice be be heard by the rest of the the rest of the community. So in those bigger lecture lecture sections, so if you do have a hundred students in your lecture section, doing a breakout where you automatically sort them into groups of three so that they have a sense of community or you automatically sort them into groups of five, do that two or three times just so that they can have that that connection and it breaks up the the zoom fatigue. Um, but it also creates community around whatever it is you're studying. Yeah. And in terms of breakout rooms specifically, you were great at giving instructions. So I observed Rachel teach many times. Like she was the best teacher in Guatemala when she, she lived in Guatemala. And I'm sure she was the best grade school teacher in Guatemala at the time. She was. It was amazing to see what her students did because we often focus on what the teacher is doing. And we forget to look at what the students are doing. But... Rachel's students were always thinking through ideas and you could see how they were growing and changing and it was just amazing. But Rachel was great at giving out instructions. So what are some ideas? Because when I've used breakout rooms, sometimes I give them clear instructions and then people go into the breakout rooms and you can't see them at the same time and they yeah. can communicate with you. So what are some ideas on giving instructions online? Yeah, for especially breakouts. Um, breakouts can be can be a little hard because they can become distracted really easily. So one of the things I like about Zoom is that you can send prompts. Like, it, firstly, the purpose of the breakout room has to be clear. Come back with two questions. Come back with this formula finished come back with, so there has to be a real, there has to be a purpose to the breakout room, um, to the breakout group. Like what is the, why are you gathering us in this group? Um, come back with a definition, right? That's a really good one, right? Like if you're struggling with some concept, having them go decide on a definition, that can be a great conversation. Um, but giving them a specific task with specific timeline, um, and then checking in, because sometimes you misestimate what the timing was. So it's regular. And again, this is one of the reasons I love Zoom for this sort of thing. You can extend the time of a breakout group in Zoom. If you need to give them an extra two minutes or if you need to give them an extra you know, five minutes, you can do that. Um, so that's the first thing. I think the second thing is encouraging them, especially if it's a large group, like if it's more than if it's more than 25 people in the class and they don't all know each other very well, making sure that they do their introductions and you can send them prompts through Zoom. So everybody introduce yourself. You have 30 seconds to introduce yourself. Okay, now here's, uh, at we, I want you to come back with two questions. Here are the questions, here, here's how much time you have. And then when they only have about a minute or two left, you say one or two minutes left, the other thing about Zoom breakout groups is you as the as the facilitator can jump in them. I don't know if you knew that, but you can you can go poke your head in to different groups and kind of see where they are, um, which is also a, just like walking around a classroom. You're like checking in on your student groups. Um, and again, I really like that facilitation on Zoom. It's very it's very convenient. I think that the the power of the breakout group, especially online, is underutilized that it, it creates so much engagement um, and gives so much diversity to the experience of the student that it really, especially in the kind of longer longer course times, can, can really be an energizing activity for the students. Yeah, and it works out so well. Zoom is so reliable in that sense. I love breakout rooms. That's my favorite feature. 
So when we're designing learning activities, such as sending people to discuss something in breakout rooms, what are some things that we should keep in, in mind? And just to give you more context, sometimes uh, I've done it and I've, I've seen other people do it where we just read this cool activity and we're like, oh, great, we'll use it in the classroom. But it doesn't necessarily have a learning objective, right? So right. what should we be thinking about as we design learning activities and online learning activities in this case? Yeah, I think I think it's important, especially in the online environment, for students to, re to, to not feel like their time is being wasted. It's a little different when you're in class because, I mean, when you're in class, you're there for that many hours. You're going to, you're going to, there's an automatic buy-in. You came to class that day, right? Like you're going to do whatever's there. Um, and and we can be a little more experimental in, in our choices. So we can we can see if this is going to be really useful or we can see if this is going to be really meaningful for the students. I think we have to hold ourselves to a little bit higher standard when it comes to the online environment because there's so many other distractions, right? They can turn off their video and audio and be doing something else entirely and still be attending class. Right. And so that's the danger. Like you're you are competing with everything else in their environment, um, everything else that they have need of. And there's no kind of there are no barriers to that because they're home. Right. They can be their mom can be asking them to decide on dinner. Their best friend can be asking them, you know, uh, for help with a boyfriend problem. And there's no way you can control that because <laughs> they can just turn off their video and audio. So. What we can do is we can be really, you know, really careful about the choices we make. And again, think about what is the what is the 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 internal transformation that this activity could do, or how does it do something that a lecture or a discussion wouldn't do, or a piece of content wouldn't do? What is it? Like, is it, is it asking them to do something divergent? Is it asking them to do something creative that applies to the, to the learning context? The other option is if you do wanna do things that are clearly just community driven, you verbalize that to them and say, hey guys, I notice everyone's kind of tired. It's the, we've been, here, we've been at it an hour and a half. We're gonna do a brain break and this, it'll take three minutes. This is what we're going to do. The intention here is that you're moving your body, you're keeping things flowing. Um, if anybody wants to just take, you know, time to, to just go to the bathroom instead, you're more than welcome to go do that. Those of you that want to stay on, we're going to do this for three minutes, right? And so that kind of activity, again, creates a sense of purpose and transformation because you verbalize, because you verbalized your intent. Yeah, absolutely. And I had a teacher who would have us stretch every day, be right when class started. Everyone would start stretching for two minutes, and it was just two minutes out of two hours. So it, it's not like we were wasting any time, and it yeah. just helped me tune into class and say, okay, now I'm in this class. And it yep. just I associated it with the course. So yeah, and you, can do that, you can do that mediated through online, but again, it's it's. And when you do that, it can feel, it can go two ways because you have to, so there's this idea that you have, you as the educator are the justifier of the activity, right? That you have to believe in this activity. Otherwise the students are not going to. <laughs> and so anytime you do these kinds of experiments, verbalize to them that you're doing an experiment. You're like, hey guys, I'm feeling really tired. I thought that when I would feel tired, we'd try this thing. Give me feedback. Let me know how it goes. And that humanizes you, which again helps with that relationship building, which has to happen informally now instead of formally. Um, one of the things I did want to talk about is this idea that, um, that online learning environments are much harder to engage with because of the lack of um, not only body language, but this other concept called paralanguage. So body, so when we're in an environment, I, I'm obviously not a small gesture person. I am a big gesture person. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I'm in an environment, there's a bigness to the space and there's an excitement, right? That's harder to convey online. Um, 
it's harder for us to be engaged with each other, especially if you're someone who isn't naturally kind of New Jersey Italian. I'm not actually Italian. I just grew up with a whole bunch of them, but <laughs> um, I grew up in New Jersey. It's essentially you're Italian if you grew up in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there are ways in which your, your ability to communicate your meaning and intent is stunted. And your ability to communicate your wanting to speak is stunted. But then there are these other things. Like, I can't look Carmen in the eye right now. I can't, I can't focus my attention on, on her um, in ways that I could otherwise. I can't whisper to anybody in this environment. I can send private messages. That's a whole other thing. The idea of back channel and how you take care of back channel during a course. And again, I think back channel is, is, is a symptom, not a issue in and of itself. So I've seen back channels used extraordinarily effectively in classes. If the back channel is a distraction, that's, that's a good signal to you that there's something else going on in the community that you need to address. And so if, if the back channel is being used to augment the learning, so back channel means like the kids, the students have some way of communicating that you as the facilitator or lecturer are not a party to. Sometimes it's Gchat, sometimes it's WhatsApp, sometimes it's, there are lots of ways that students do this. Um, and it can feel as, especially as a professor, like they're making fun of you or that they're being disrespectful. If the course is well designed, very often the back channel is really just a support structure for when students don't have clarity. Mm -hmm. if, if the course isn't meeting particular student needs, that back channel can become a way for students to vent their frustrations. And that, that means that that needs to be surfaced in the course so that students feel like they're being heard and that they can give that feedback in the course and they don't feel like they have to give it in the back channel. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of ways that one can do that. Um, surveys are great, but really an open conversation of just saying, "Hey guys, it seems like some people are frustrated. What's going on? How can we how can we adapt to this? I'd like everyone to go around and say something they think that's going well in this course and something that they think needs to be improved on. Um, and if you if you do that consistently." The students will see that there are no ill effects from saying that something's going poorly. They'll they'll feel that you they can trust the environment for that. But then you as the facilitator get all this amazing feedback for how your students are experiencing the course. And it's surfaced as opposed to being hidden in the back channels. Yeah, and that's so important right now that we're moving learning online, basically. Uh, usually students come up after class and give you some feedback one-on-one. -on -one. If they feel like they trust you, they often give you feedback after a class of you, or you can ask them what's go what's working well, what can we improve? But that's something that we don't have right now. So it's part of creating those moments of community as we were talking about. And in this case, also sending out surveys or asking for feedback uh, via yeah. email, because we don't have that time where we, where we can meet each other after class and keep talking about ideas or asking for feedback. The last, the last kind of thing that, that I want to talk about as being an advantage to this technology is that you can, you can ask different kinds of things of students than you could before, right? So you can ask that they meet with you. So instead of, instead of running your class synchronously twice a year or twice a week, one week is, um, is your lecture synchronous. The second week you spend that entire that entire period of time having one-on-ones where you speak with a student for 10 or 15 minutes and you're able to get through all of your students because you you have that time in your schedule it doesn't fatigue the students because they get to do their work asynchronously it creates relationships with you it gives you all this amazing feedback um, that's an option the other is as part of your course design, requiring study groups, that could be an option where you have um, not group work, but that that a group will submit their reflections on a particular reading, which means that they get together socially as opposed to 
acad- like it, 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 in addition to the academic work, there's a social relational piece there that can be really helpful. Um, so there, again, think about what the opportunity with the, with the technology is that, that there are things you can't do in real space. Um, and then additionally thinking about what the, what the technology can do that you, that, that leaves you free to do the things you're best at. Awesome. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you everyone who's watching and sending us questions. So the first question that we have is from Isa Moino. And this, she ah. says, <laughs> is super amazing. She says, this is an amazing conversation. And her question is, what are some best practices to translate hands-on and collaborative courses into online learning? Yeah, I'm a big fan of actually having requiring students to do things that aren't on the computer <laughs> as part of your course design for an online course. So anything that takes them outside or offline, and then they have to submit documentation uh, is a great is a great activity. Um, and so I think that that all the things that you could do in class, you can do outside in a kind of reduced way. If there's experimentation that you want them to do or calculation, giving them the kitchen sink version or the like the in the woods version of whatever it was. If they're doing um, like experimental activities, there are a lot of simulations, but my preference would always be to try and simulate it in the real world somehow and give them that tactile physical experience. Because again, so many of us are just spending so much of our time in front of these screens <laughs> that it's such a breath to be able to go out and to, to do those kinds of creative physical activities. If you need them to wireframe something for a design course, make it that they have to draw the wireframe instead of using a wireframe platform, right? Make it so that they have to you know, physically do something um, because that's a skill in the world, but also it creates that sense of energy around the activity. Yeah. Plus it's like when we go to the supermarket, it's a, it's such an event nowadays. I get so excited because I have to go out and buy groceries, which is something I didn't like to do before. You didn't, you weren't, that didn't excite you six months ago? No. So really going outside and doing something, it just feels great. And it's great for learning and, also, it's great for the emotional context in which we all are at the moment. So the next question is from Stephanie Bolaños, and she says, thank you, Rachel and Carmen. What's the most fundamental change that teachers have to make to start creating more significant learning experiences? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that being... So there's a Montessori says that uh, that an, uh, that a that a teacher has to be transformed into being a Montessori teacher. You have to see the world differently. Um, to see the child that is not yet there, right? So I think the way we have to transform ourselves, or the is that we have to. It is a crisis of imagination into what the capacity of student independence is. So um, the most transformational thing we can do is to cultivate a creativity in how we imagine the possibilities for, for students to be self-directed and creative in their own learning. Maybe that's we, an answer. We definitely could give more credit to the learner and like respecting them more and see what they could do, which is another reason for why I think you were an amazing teacher. Because you would see all these twelve-year-olds, eleven-year-olds, like managing their own learning and their own education. So once you see that, or once you see a Montessori classroom with three-year-olds being able to self-manage and to concentrate for long, long hours, then you're like, well, why can't we as adults live peacefully and and self-manage in the same way? And our next question is from Albert Loon, and he's asking, it's, it's connected to this conversation that we were just having. And the question is, how can we use online technology to, oh, could you hear that? 
the last question? Okay. So it's how can we use online technology to give students greater autonomy to manage their collaborative learning process? Yeah. And the question continues. Is there a way to use technology to cultivate a greater sense of autonomy and ownership of the learning process and environment? Absolutely. And I think that absolutely. And so, uh, hi, Bert. <laughs> um, and so, so one of the things that technology again allows them to do is not only use their own time, but also give them the creative activity of developing their own um, their own assessments and their own work. So because you can have them do so many things collaboratively, you can have you know, your rubrics, you can have hyperlink documents, you can have all these things that will allow students to develop their own way that they want to be assessed, their own way that they want to um, show their learning, and then get comments from their from their course from their classmates on on that and whether they think it's robust enough. So one of the things that's scary sometimes about turning over assessment and and course design to a student is they don't know what they don't know, right? They they don't have they don't have the experience you do into knowing what the what the potential is for the deep work and learning that can be done. And one of the ways you can surface that is by having other students comment and other faculty comment on what their plan is. Um, and so having minimum requirements, but then allowing them to expand past those minimum requirements and getting the feedback from the community can really open up the possibility of what they, um, what they can do to demonstrate their learning. And when you do that, you get like incredible variation I have. A, I was blessed in my in my master's course, um, that that they let us they they gave us free reign, often on how we would on what what our final projects would be, but we had to submit them for review from the class, and so the class had a standard where they would push us on those those options, um, which would ultimately improve because it would access all of their brilliant knowledge. Yeah. That's amazing. And the, there's one question from Shady and Shady is asking, how can we evaluate students learning in a meaningful way? And that's, yeah, that's related to this idea of how do we self-assess and how do we use peer evaluation and not just, it's not all, it doesn't always have to be the teacher who's giving the students feedback. Right. I think rubrics, rubrics to me are the most powerful tool you have. And there's a, there's a website called Rubistar, R-U-B-I-S-T-A-R, um, which is really rudimentary, but it, it's a good starting place for a lot of rubrics um, because it just helps you start to conceptualize rubrics for different types of work. Um, what I would always do is I would have students grade according to their rubric first. So they would they would submit the rubric with the final with the final work, um, and then I would write comments on it, so that they got they got feedback from me on the rubric. But first, there was a, a self assessment piece, um, and that would help help them focus that activity. Thank you, Rachel. There's another question from Monica Celaya, and she's asking how what do we do with students who have their cameras turned off? Yes, so that, is, that is such a good question. Well, I think first is just like when you're in class, um, in your, in whatever your, um, uh, um, in your syllabus, you have rule, terms of engagement, rules of engagement that you have with the students. Um, I think that similarly, you should establish that early on in your course, um, that so this is a seminar course. During the seminar course, we ask that you keep your video on so that we can see how you're engaging. You're more than welcome to turn um, to turn uh, the audio off if you have background noise. Uh, and if you need to leave class for any reason, please send me a private message. And so that establishes some norms. If that's not working, then then comes the relational aspect and, and reaching out to that student outside of class and saying, hey, I noticed that your video was off for 15 minutes during the course today. Is, that, is everything okay? Is there anything we can do differently? Remember in the syllabus, it says that you're 
in the syllabus it says that your video has to be on. Uh, let me know if there's any way I can help. Um, and here, here's what the consequences are for, for participation. So thinking through, like it requires a bit of a redesign of your, of your syllabus as you think through what the relational rules of engagement are going to be and how you're going to manage that. Um, but don't forget to look at your syllabus and change your syllabus as you're thinking about how to redesign your courses. And we need to over communicate those expectations. Because students yeah. often forget. They often forget. So if you're noticing that some people have their video off, you can always verbalize, hey, everyone, I noticed that some people have their video off. Remember that part of our, in the syllabus, it says that we're going to keep our video up. Um, you're more than welcome to mute if you have background noise. So we have one question from Fernando Franco. And he's asking what tools and tricks can teachers use to facilitate online class projects? that tap into students' intrinsic motivations? Yeah, I think, so a couple of things. Having very clear milestones that require um, feedback is the best way to do that. So to keep them on track because they're not in class together. Maybe it's like a weekly progress update with a reflection on what they learned through the project. Um, also having those gallery walks where you have the you have dates where other students have to look at their projects and give feedback is a great motivator <laughs> that, that helps keep them on track. Um, and then a lot of the collaborative tools like Google Classroom and those sorts of things that let, that let people comment and work together collaboratively synchronously, um, the, Google, the Google Docs suite would be, would be the best way to do that. But definitely having regular check-ins so that there's motivation to keep moving forward on the project and then having peer review, which again helps with that motivation to keep keep moving forward on the project. Um, and then also groups should probably be slightly smaller um, just because coordination is so much more difficult in online spaces than it is in, in group spaces. If you had a project that was five people, maybe you should think about having it be three people. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. And our last question is from Tecnologías Sin Fronteras on YouTube, and they're asking, where can we get information about the history of technology in education? And I would just ask a general question. What readings or books or ideas would you recommend that we keep thinking about to continue? Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to give you some names and I'm looking over here because that's where my bookshelf is for my courses. Um, Neil Selwyn's Education and Technology is fantastic. Um, that's probably the best history of education book and the kind of future of education. He's also the one that wrote um, uh, Should Robots Replace Teachers? I, I think Robot Proof is actually really fantastic by Aoun. Teaching Students How to Learn is a fantastic book. Um, and let's see, those are probably a good start. Um, if you're interested in kind of going deep, there's a good book called Artificial Intelligence in Education, which kind of starts looking really future thinking at what artificial intelligence options could be. But those are probably a, a good start. So Selwyn, Aoun, teach, uh, teach Students How to Learn, and then, um, and then uh, Artificial Intelligence in Education. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you everyone who was asking questions and watching. And we're sorry we couldn't get, go through all the questions, but please shoot us an email and uh, I'll make sure the questions reach Rachel. I'll jump, <laughs> on, I'll jump on the Facebook feed and I'll, I'll, I'll go answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we also want to remind people, I'll, I'll switch back to Spanish, but queremos recordar que el próximo UFM talk, que es reshaping our future, Será impartido por Ciencias Económicas en, en UFM Facebook Live y newmedia.ufm.edu. Es hoy a las 6 p.m. Es buenísimo. La moderadora va a ser Mónica Zelaya, que hizo una pregunta hoy, está viendo acá. Y tienen un emprendedor y un académico también hablando de qué nos espera en el futuro. Así que no se pierdan los UFM Talks. Los pueden ver en Facebook de la UFM, en YouTube de New Media y en newmedia.ufm.edu. Y muchas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Thank you, Rachel. And goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you all.